Pleasure to welcome Charlie Froman from the University of Iowa, and we're going to hear about skeins and characters. Okay. So there's there's an analogy between algebra and topology that actually is sort of a big deal. You know, here's a here's a ring, and here's a manifold, and then here's a module. And, and, and this is a knot or link. Okay. And uh, this has been a big deal in arithmetic geometry in recent years. And, and so if you take a dedicated domain, let's say you tell and you localize it a prime ideal, and you get something that has the homological properties of cannot complement, and then in fact there's a copy of z plus z corresponding to peripheral subgroup, and in fact the Dedekind domain has a fundamental group. And they play these things up off of one another. Um, and in that analogy, for instance, uh, the Legendre symbol is actually a linking number, and the Iwasawa polynomial, if you follow all the definitions through, is in fact the Alexander. So that's sort of this side of the story. And, and what I do is, is the other side of the analogy. And so what I do is I, I explore topological phenomena in analogy to number theory. And uh, <clears throat> if you have a short, exact sequence of, of modules, it's it's sometimes, you know, uh, people like to then say that, you know, they like to flatten out the extension by saying it's equivalent to the sum of the, of the two modules that you're extending by. And this is a, a, a common picture. So what you're supposed to imagine is there's some link out there and you can see this much of the link. And in all the diagrams, it's the same link far away. And then people write down this, okay? And what you're supposed to think of is that a crossing in a, in a link is actually, your, the link is an extension of two other links. And these are the two other links. And then this is a graded theory, and so then the A keeps track of the, the grading. And that's the Kalkman bracket scheme relation. So they're actually not just regular vanilla links for this to work. They have to be framed links. And a, a framed link is, a, is an annulus. Link is a disjoint union of annuli. They, Distinct union of annuli. And the annuli have a preferred side. And then whenever you apply this relation, you have the preferred side up, and that way you don't smooth and get a Mervius band. And so you have to keep track of that. But it's it's sort of a trivial consideration because you could twist the annulus around and have the other side be you know, the preferred side. So, so sorry, when, when you say that the, that's an extension of the other two, I mean, is that in some precise sense? I mean, well, actually, one of the major conjectures in the field, it's not, see, this, this particular algebra is, is related to SL2C characters, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really more about representation theory than not theory. But there's a, another uh, skein algebra skein relation called the, the, coming from the Homfley skein relation, which, you know, looks like, and now I'm going to make a mess, these are oriented, you know, just take it with a grain of salt, okay, I'm just making it up as I go along. And, and you know, I, I, I probably could have lost these by building that into the definition by building them into the framing. So the, the conjecture, and now what you do is you form an algebra 
So you take a cylinder over surface and you take all the oriented uh, links, including the empty link, as a basis. And then you mod out by this skein relation. And then you, there's another skein relation that keeps track of when you have a trivial component. And the conjecture is that the Homfley skein algebra, now it's, once again, it's a graded thing because of the cues, and, and it probably, you know, is the Hall algebra of the uh, derived category of the Fukaya algebra of the underlying surface of the surface. And the first case of this uh, was proved for the torus by Peter Samuelson and uh, Hugh Morton, and that's, I think, in the Duke Journal. And then there's a uh, more, you know, relative case for the, the disk that's been proved by uh, Cooper and Samuelson. So this is a, a major, major conjecture in the area. So, yeah, We're good? Okay. All right. But I, I want to focus on this one because it's, it's a lot easier because you can get rid of crossings. Okay. And I think the first question to ask yourself when you see a relation like this is where does it come from? And so suppose I, I have a, a two by two matrix. Boy, everything's A. How about M, two by two matrix, with determinant one? Okay, so AD minus BC equals one. And then, you know, you, you calculate the uh, characteristic polynomial. And what you get is lambda squared minus the trace of M uh, plus the identity you know, plus one because it's a determinant one matrix. I think you're missing a lambda. Oh, 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 thank you. <laughs> All right. And, and then by uh, <clears throat> the Cayley Hamilton identity, when you replace everything by matrices, that's the zero matrix. That's well and good, but it'd be better if we got rid of the square. So we multiply through by M inverse. And then we multiply by another matrix, just because we can. And now we take the trace, and we remember that the trace is linear. And we get the trace of Mn <coughs> minus the trace of M times the trace of N plus the trace of M inverse N is, is zero. So then you guys like character varieties, right? So, uh, <coughs> so here's, a, here's a punctured torus, okay? And the fundamental group of the punctured torus is a free group of two generators. And what you can do is put the base point down here somewhere, and then you can have uh, you can have an edge when you cross it. It imparts uh, the matrix M as holonomy, and maybe uh, N the matrix N here. And now I've represented all representations of the fundamental group of this uh, object into S up to C. So now let me draw a picture of traces. So if I take this loop, and now it doesn't make any difference which way I'm writing the root, the, the loop, because remember the inverse of, of M is like this, and so the inverse and the F have the same trace. So I don't even have to put an orientation on it. And that's a picture of the trace of M. And then this is a picture of the trace of N, which is this term in the identity. <clears throat> and now, according to that polarized Cayley Hamilton identity, that's equal to the trace of M times.
times n plus, uh, boy, this is like more drawing than I've done in months. Okay, <laughs> and now the trace of m times n inverse. And what you notice is the three pictures are, in fact, the same, except for that little circle where you see a version of that uh, skein relation, except now I don't care which one's over and one under. And so what this is, is a quantization of that. And specifically, like when I was like young, uh, I computed the polarized Cayley Hamilton identity for UQSL2, which is the quantum group, and, and this pops out. This is in fact the Cayley Hamilton identity for the quantum group. So that's where it comes from. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a surface, F, and we're going to cross it with an interval to make sure it has some depth. And then L is going to be the framed links up to isotopy. Uh, A is going to be an element of the complex numbers that isn't zero because I want to use this reciprocal. I formed the vector space whose basis is L and then I mod out by the submodule, spanned by, here we go, uh, this minus that minus that, whenever you see it. And whenever you have a framed link and somewhere in it you see a zero framed circle, then you can replace that by this number, which when a is plus or minus 1, is just 2, which is the trace of the identity matrix, times L. And that is the uh, Kaufman bracket skein module of F at that value <coughs> of A. But in fact, it's an algebra under stacking. So what I can do, like, like Here's a torus. So what is F here again? A surface. Is it closed or can it have boundary? Doesn't matter. Just oriented. So and the reason why it has to be oriented is you're using so, uh, that. I'm slightly confused. So what's the relationship of what's written below to the surface F? Uh, these are the framed links up to isotopy in F cross oh, one, okay. which since I can resolve crossings, okay. okay, this has basis of this guy is all multi-curves. So what this is is an algebra on the multi-curves on a surface. That's what we're doing. So you take two multi-curves, like here's a torus, there's a multi-curve. You, you multiply it by another curve, you put the one on the left on top. And uh, that's the product, but of course, since you can resolve, what that really is, is uh, A times that. Is. 
So, uh, by the way, it's also true when a equals 1, uh, but it's not canonical. You have to choose a spin structure. So now we're going to assume that A is a root of unity and, and say uh, N is a root of unity. And just for the sake of sanity, we're going to assume that N is not equivalent to 0 in mod 4. Okay. It turns out we understand exactly what's going on in that case, but it's, it's harder. Um, <clears throat> so, now what you do is you let m be n divided by the greatest common divisor of n and 2. And then there are these polynomials called the chunk. Is this is a primitive nth root? Yeah, primitive okay. nth root. Yeah, there are these polynomials. What these are, are just the Adams operations for SL2. So you remember the Adams operation takes a character to the character that assigns the same number to the nth power. And so if you understand the Adams operations for SL2, these are, these are the polynomials that do it. And, and in general, the uh, kth one is x times tk minus k minus 1 minus tk minus 2. Yeah. And then what you can do is you can take a map from CL to CL, which is threaded by TM. So remember that, that really we're looking at frame links. And then what we can do is on that frame link, for instance, if I was going to thread it with T2, I just lay down <laughs> two guys, and then I subtract two times the empty guy. But you do this in a multilinear fashion over all the components of any link. And then this descends to K epsilon of F into K A of F, and it's a homomorphism uh, where epsilon is a to the negative m squared, which is, you know, an element of plus or minus 1. And that map's injective. And so this algebra is a ring extension of the coordinate ring of the so character ring, but it's a, a non commutative extension. And uh, so now let's Assume f is finite type. Okay. So, uh, finite type. It's a uh, the genus is G, and say the number of punctures is is P. Okay. Then. Uh, KA of F has finite rank over uh, K negative 1 of F. And I, I should also point out that the image of tau over here, <coughs> this is tau, the image of tau is contained in the, the center of KA. So then the rank over this, what I mean is, is you localize. To, so you get an algebra over the function field. And now I want the dimension of the vector space you get. And it's <coughs> m raised to negative 3 times the Euler characteristic of f minus twice the number of punctures. That's the dimension. And um, it 
has no zero denominators. So what you're supposed to think of here is a quantum group at a root of unity. Okay? And the representation theory of a quantum group at a root of unity. And what you find out is there are, you know, the standard representations you know and love, of which there are only finitely many irreducible ones. And then there are these cyclic irreducible representations, and there are uncountably many of those. And they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with a branched cover of the Poisson dual of whatever you're So given a quantum group, there's a group and it's got a Poisson dual. And then there's a branched cover of the Poisson dual. And then the irreducible representations of the quantum group correspond. And, uh, and this has a, a very similar representation theory. So, now we're talking about finite type surfaces, and, you know, you've got some punctures, and what I'm doing is I'm, like, there's puncture one, puncture two, puncture three, and, and what I can do is I can draw a little loop, del one, del two, del three, little loops, surrounding all three of them. And then uh, what I mean by del is, of course, the union of all those groups. And the first thing you need to do is you need to identify what the center of K and of F is. And what it is is the image of tau adjoined those loops delta. It's the largest sub, you know, the smallest subring that contains tau in the image of those guys. And this is once again, an analogy to a quantum group at a root of unity, what happens is you take the nth powers of the generators of the quantum group, and that produces a large subalgebra in the center, and then what you tack on is the Cassian. And so these guys play the role of the Cassian. So, so can you remember what is tau? Tau is this threading map. So, oh, I see. Yeah, so, it, so, so basically, the image of tau is the SL2C characters of the fundamental group of the surface. In the case of a closed surface, you're not adjoining anything. The center of the skein algebra is the SL2C characters of the fundamental group of the surface. Uh, and, you know, another feature of this, you take the action of the mapping class group on the surface, and it extends pretty handily to the cylinder by just letting it act trivially in the cylinder direction. And that acts on the frame links inside the cylinder. There's a natural action of the mapping class group on this algebra as automorphisms. Okay, so it's an automorphism of the algebra. Now, given one of these loops, what I can do is I can take tau m of that loop, uh, and that's an element of you know, the image of tau. And then this is a polynomial of degree m. And so what happens is the center is a finite extension of the characters. And what you should imagine is that the variety corresponding to the center is a branched cover of the character variety of the surface. And Francis, you know, can always turn a word, right? That's the variety of shadow. <coughs> All right. <coughs> well, <coughs> so then, what do the Irreducible representations of K of F. 
look like? Well, maybe we should just first understand what happens when we localize the algebra, because that gives you a pretty big clue. And there's a theorem called Posner's theorem. And it says that, OK, this, you guys know what a prime algebra is? Nobody's charging up to the front of them. OK. So, you know, like if you study non-commutative rings, you, you really want matrices to be one of the rings you study, right? Because if you study the theory of non-commutative rings and you left out matrices, what, what examples would you have, right? And the problem with matrices is that they have lots of zero divisors. And so you need a condition that extends the notion of being a domain to a non-commutative algebra in such a way that matrices satisfy that. So R is prime if uh, for every A and B in R so that for every R in R, A, R, B equals zero, that implies that A equals zero or B equals zero. And then when you say prime ideal in, this, in, in the non-commutative world, what you mean is that, you know, that if uh, A, R, B belongs to the ideal for every R, then A belongs to the ideal or B belongs to the ideal. The point being that the quotient by a prime ideal should be a prime ring. Okay. And then, you know, matrices, right? You, you know, e, I, J, this is the matrix with all zeros except for uh, a one in the I, J entry. And then you're going to multiply that by E, K, L. And, and, and you better, you better, E, K, L, you better have something you can plug in there <laughs> so that it's not zero. And of course, you can put E, J, K in there. And so matrices are a prime ring. And essentially, the proof is <clears throat> making that form form. The Posner theorem says that uh, if uh, R is a prime ring of finite rank over its center Z. And I'd like to say something that a commutative uh, prime ring isn't it just reduces. Uh, then what you do is you let S be you know, all non-zero elements of the center, and then you form S inverse of R. And this is a, a central, simple algebra, which, you know, probably if prime rings leave you cold, this leaves you cold too. That means uh, over, over the center, over S inverse of R. So uh, that means the center is exact over, not S inverse of R, S inverse of C. The, the center is just you know, the field of fractions of C. And, and then this algebra just it doesn't have any two-sided ideals. So, and when you have a sim central simple algebra, what you can do is take a finite extension of its center so that it becomes a matrix algebra. And so then S inverse of R is, you know, well, it's embedded in M and of E as an order. And what it means to be embedded as an order is that that one so, so what is e? What? What is e? It's an extension. It's a finite extension of this field. That's a field, and that's a field. It's a finite extension. So it's a splitting field. Basically, what you need to do is make sure you've got uh, some eigenspaces. And and we used over an arbitrary field. You don't necessarily get eigenspaces. And so then what you do is you add stuff so you can find eigenspaces. And 
you only have to do it for finally many elements. And then all of a sudden, uh, this becomes a major algebra. And, and then what does it mean as an order? It means that if I take S inverse R and then the center of this matrix algebra is just, you know, E times the identity. If I take this, that spans the whole thing. So this is like uh, integer matrices lying inside real matrices, for instance. So it's, it's big. <clears throat> and then this, this tells you what the generic irreducible representation looks like. So there are these things called uh, central polynomials. I think Rasmus Law. And, and let's see, who's who's the guy from Sh Ed? What's who's the other central polynomial guy? It's <laughs> like a Chicago guy. Yeah. Too old. Anyways. There are these polynomials <clears throat> for you know n by n matrices that uh, always take on a central value. You know, like like if once again if you have a two by two matrix, right? So two by two matrix, you know x squared minus the trace of m times x plus the determinant of m equals 0. So x squared minus the trace of m x is equal to, and that should have the identity there, the determinant of m times the identity. So that's a central matrix. Okay. So then what I do is... Sorry, you have a minus sign? Where, where, where's the... Oh, yeah. The minus. So then what I do is I consider x, y minus y, x. And the nice thing about any matrix of that form is it has trace zero. And then I square it, and that's equal to negative the determinant of x, y minus y, x times the identity in C. So, so no matter what pair of matrices I plug in, I always get a central matrix. And these, these exist for all n. And, um, and then what you can do when you have a situation like this is now you can take a value of that central polynomial on that, that's non-zero from plugging in things in the algebra. And then you localize. And what you did is think about central polynomials. If, if your polynomial, you know, so if Gn is a central polynomial for Mn, then uh, on mn minus 1 or any less, gn evaluates to 0. And the reason that is, I can take the smaller matrix and fill it out with zeros to make it in here and plug it in there. And since it's central, it has to all be zeros. And so when you localize, and boy, so then what you do is you get this element c, uh, a non-zero value of central polynomial. And then go back to the original algebra, and, and C is in the center, and so I can localize. And now I take my algebra and I just localize, you know, invert the powers of C. And now all representations of R sub C are uh, n-dimensional, all irreducible representations, representations are n-dimensional. Okay, and then there's a, a theorem of, of Artin and, uh, and, and Percesi independently that implies that, that R C is, is as a one. And the thing about an Asimaya algebra is that the two-sided ideals uh, are in one-to-one correspondence with the maximal ideals of the center. And so, so generically, there is a one-to-one correspondence.
Alles. Between maximal ideals. center and irreducible representations representations of R of R C. Well of R, because you're basically what you're doing is you're just throwing out a, a meager set of the irreducible representations of the algebra. So then Tong when Farther, this, by the way, was joint work with, you know, Joanna Kanyevardashinska, and and Tom Lay. And then he went he went farther, and, and so then the basically what this means is that for a closed surface irreducible representations of the Kaufman brackets gain algebra are in one-to-one -one correspondence with representations of the fundamental group of the scheme of the fundamental group of the underlying surface in the SL2C. And now whenever a representation uh, of the fundamental group is fixed by an elementary mapping class group, then using the nether scholar theorem, you can actually get up to uh, a scalar multiple, a well-defined matrix acting in that representation. So we have a way of tearing apart the dynamics of an elemental mapping class group that fixed representation. But then, in fact, what Tong went on and proved was that uh, you know, K of F is, is a maximal order, okay, which is an integrality condition. And then that allows him to say that uh, at any point of the variety of shadows, so the variety of shadows, that's the maximal spectrum of, of the center, which in the case of closed surface is just the points of a character variety. Uh, if uh, the irreducible representations uh, of K, A of F whose kernel So where this I don't know where this where this comes from is is it's some sort of uh, geometric quantization. That's what's going on. There's got to be a holomorphic line bundle over the character variety, and then what's happening is the uh, you're choosing some collection of the character functions to act on the holomorphic sections of that line bundle as operators. And that's where the picture comes from. But this is another peculiarity. So 
of, about the situation. So once again, we're just we're, uh, we're going to localize at the center. This blew my mind. So now we localize it. This is a division algebra. To me, is really right, and then what you're supposed to think is from you know Schur's lemma when you're doing representation theory uh, over a field which is you know not algebraically closed as the function field of the character variety is, then the uh, the commutant of the of an irreducible representation is a division algebra. And then it, it makes you wonder if maybe you can define the Kaufman brackets gain algebra as like the commutant of the Witten Reshitika Turaya representation of the Mathis class group. Is S inverse K of the You know, a lot is known about, about division algebras. And one of the things about division algebras is they have large uh, fields lying in there. And if a division algebra has dimension, and it's always a square, and the reason why it's always a square is, once again, you can uh, extend, take a finite extension of the center and turn it into a matrix algebra, and matrix algebra is always that dimension A squared. So if the division algebra has n squared, then any maximal field has dimension n. And so, Here's a way to produce a <coughs> maximal field in the Kaufman bracket gain algebra. What you do is you just take a pants decomposition of the surface. How am I doing? Uh, I'm not there yet, am I? I'm, I'm there. Shoo. Okay. And then what you do is you take the center of K A of F and then you uh, you, you then uh, can uh, adjoin those curves to it. And this will be a field because there's no crossings. Remember, we multiply. So there's no crossings. And, and then, of course, S inverse of that, that is a maximal field. And Then this is uh, work with Joanna. This just appeared in Mott Sanctuary. So this is with Joanna Kanyabarczynska. One time I just wrote her initials up on the board. And Karen wrote really. She got upset with me. That's all she gets? <laughs> Three letters? <laughs> Okay. Ever since then. Okay. So so now we can prove there exist pants decompositions. P and Q so that we can take P and Q the pants algebras 
and we, we don't actually localize the whole thing. We just we can actually just localize that one element and and that actually spans. So everything can be everything can be written as a linear combination of one set of pants curves over another. And and more or less, you know, any pants decomposition coming from a Hagar splitting of S3 does it. And there's a there's a way of getting rational coordinates on tight Miller space by a dual pair of pants decompositions due to the Thompson and, and Felix. And more or less what we're doing is we're taking the the same theorem that they got for tight Miller space and it's not cumulative version. And then what this does is it this this yields specific, and we can do it in punctured surfaces too. You have to be a little more careful in punctured surface. But then uh, we get specific models for the irreducible representations. Write C square brackets P. So um, I just I'm just adjoining these curves. To that so but you join them each individually. It's not like you yeah. take the link which is in that picture and multiply oh, that by C because no, that'd be one dimensional. And, right? and remember, this is the smallest ring containing them, and so that's essentially a poly. You know, those are polynomials in the curves. I see. So it's an infinite. It's infinite dimensional over C. Yeah. Well, actually, it's 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 finite dimensional because remember that that when I apply TM to any one of those curves, I'm back in the center, which means I'm back in the complex numbers. And so this is actually a finite dimension. Of dimension, of dimension M raised to the 3G minus M. Okay. Well, how did I do? Pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, so you, you were saying some point in the middle about um, when you had a, a character that was fixed by a, a mapping class. Like, so I'm sure this question will surprise you coming from me, but suppose you have a hyperbolic three manifold that fibered over the circle. Exactly. So, so then you have your monodromy representation is 
fixing this particular character in PSL2C. Yes. And so, how does that? Well, then you're going to like. Well, you have to normalize it because you only know it up to a scalar, so that you fix it. So it has the terminal one, and then you take the trace, and that's what everybody calls the quantum hyperbolic invariant, and that that should, as the root of unity goes to infinity, that should grow exponentially, and the exponential growth rate will be proportional to the volume. Of the oh, I see. So this is like sort of the volume. And that, for these. that that that. That is exactly the construction. I should say that a lot of this was inspired by the Francis and Helen Bonahan. Uh, Bonahan. Boy. <laughs> Isn't that just terrible? I've known him for 35 years and I can't spell his name. Bonahan and Wong. It was what they were they were doing. Um, and uh, the the structure of the representation theory was conjectured by them. But we, sort of a combination of us, realized that it was really a question about whether you could make the algebra as a variable because uh, that's it. That was exactly the conjecture was that the irreducible representations uh, were determined by their intersection with the center. And the thing about an Azamai algebra is that the two-sided ideals are determined exactly by the intersection of the center. So, and so it was actually it's a truly you know, collaborative.